Well, guys, why don't you all pull up a chair? We got an exciting treat for you today. I want to pull up the uh, love seat, actually, because I'm going to pull up and be two loving chairs this one. for you and your valiant crew. <laughs> <laughs> we're uh, we're bringing in um, Charles Hildebrandt. Charles is the um, the son of the great Tim Hildebrandt and uh, nephew of uh, the great uh, Greg Hildebrandt, the brothers Hildebrandt, yes. who. Uh, you know, was such a staple of fantasy and sci-fi art in the 70s and 80s. In addition to their brilliant Lord of the Rings work, of course, you probably, everyone knew their iconic Star Wars poster. Yeah, and a little, uh, little poster that some people might have seen. Yeah, and it's, it's, everywhere. it's a funny story because um, Charles is a longtime fan of the podcast. And uh, I was reading this issue of magazine that I found in my garage. I was looking at these old Starlogs, and it was this long article about this unproduced film by the Hildebrands. And I'm like, hey, Charles is a, a fan of the show. Maybe we should have him on to talk about his dad and about this project. You know, this is how I I, I can find out more. Would you like That's to right. know more? Well, I'll call up one of our <laughs> listeners. So, um, uh, so we, we, I reached out to him. He said, I'd love to. I have great stories. And, you know, you can just sense the love he has for his dad. And, um, that's so meaningful, I think, to all of us that he can share these great stories about, uh, his father. Maybe we should have saved this one for Father's Day, but, uh, no. Um, but this was, uh, this was, a, I, I think, a real treat for, uh, fans of the show. Um, really, really interesting stories that I haven't heard about Star Wars, about Lord of the Rings and, and, um, you know, of course, for all you Deadly Spawn fans, there's a lot of information to glean about that as well. So without any further ado, let's bring in Charles Hildebrandt, star of the Deadly Spawn. Well, as you know, uh, given it's the 40th anniversary of the Deadly Spawn, it was very important to us to bring that film star to the podcast, none other than Charles Hildebrandt. But of course, that's not really why you're here, but we'll pretend what? it is, right? <laughs> uh, of course it is. That's the reason I'm here, right? <laughs> That's what the agent told him. I, Charles you know, is, uh... I'm sure it is. I know it is. I got the memo because I, uh, I brought a deadly spawn with me, so that. Uh... Oh, nice. Oh my, mom, is that you? That is so cool. Oh wow. my god. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, and for those of you obviously who are listening to this, you can't see uh, what uh, Charles has in the background. Um, which is the brilliant work of his father, Tim Hildebrandt, and his twin brother, Greg. Uh, I think most of us uh, who didn't have the Farrah Fawcett poster in the mid-70s, or maybe we did have the Farrah Fawcett, <laughs> but we also both. had yeah, they, the Hildebrandt's equal time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Star Wars uh, um, poster. One of the most memorable one-sheets, if not the most memorable one-sheet of all time, um, and of course, back there, I think we see some Lord of the Rings, uh, and uh, we got a lot of a lot of cool things to talk about. And it's funny because uh, Charles comes to us uh, through a very interesting way. He's a listener, a longtime listener of the podcast. What? So <laughs> I'm a fan what? before the podcast. Oh my goodness! <laughs> so we're, absolutely. We're, we're... By the way, I think in my particular case, it wasn't Farrah Fawcett; it was Jenny Auger from Logan's Run yeah. on my wall. Understood. But, Understood. You know, we all know. I, yeah. I, I got to tell you, yeah. no question. Yeah. I would go with Jenny Auger over. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, Jenny put herself up on the circuit, so it's all fair. <laughs> yeah, she's available, right? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's completely right. Yeah, no, I love and, it. And and you know, you don't know what kind of work uh, you know Farrah did at the new U shop. Uh, and yeah, uh, is that really her? Jenny, it was all natural. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. No, it was it's uh, so true. <laughs> but we got we got to watch ourselves because um, we we haven't done our Logan's Run episode yet. We got to see. Oh wow! Run okay, episode. right. So <laughs> save it. Um, yeah, no. So right off the bat, let me establish my Star Trek bona fides in a couple of ways. So first off, um, I attended my first Star Trek convention when I was nine years old in 1976. Oh my wow. It was the Bicentennial 10. There is, that is the program guide, which somehow I kept, nine-year-old wow. me kept. Wow. Which now, where have. was that convention? The, 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 this was at the Statler Hilton Hotel, or what was yes. then the Statler Hilton, mm. which is uh, right across from Madison Square Garden. Right. Like, yep. It was a shithole then. It's a shithole now. <laughs> it is. It was always. Yeah. It was always. Yeah, but, always. You know, and it. Uh, but it was. You know, to nine year old me. Oh, <laughs> yeah, totally. I went to. Creation used to do a bunch of their conventions yeah. there too. They did. Many Creation times. took over. 
fairly soon after that. And and yeah, exactly. That that's even exactly. when I was a kid, I knew it was a shithole. Like yeah. I, I could tell. Like this is glamorous <laughs> Manhattan. This cannot be, you know, what passes well, off as beautiful hotel, uh, yeah. a luxurious hotel. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, I, at the time, I, you know, I was nine, you were a kid, too. I, we all didn't know anything about venue fees and, you know, well, what it's going to take, you know, how much can you really spend on a Star Trek yeah. convention in 1976, you know? Yeah. Well, Adam tells time. this great story about uh, on the podcast about how he got his dad to sign uh, the agreement. The, the, you know, on the um, the yeah. hotel, the first hotel for the first yeah. convention they did, yeah. uh, and that his dad like worked uh, around the corner from the Stadler Hilton or something like right. that, and then you know the Commodore Hotel where the other um, Star Trek conventions took place wasn't any better. Okay, the, yeah, the I don't Grand think Central, I went to It's right. now Let, let's owned just, let's by just the man whose name shall not be named. Urine decontamination is not cheap nor easy. So <laughs> let's be honest. Yeah. Okay. And again, I'm sorry. I just have to keep establishing this. So um, also, um, you're, you're already on the show. You don't have to convince us. Well, I know. Okay. I have right. to justify it for, some, for the audience, maybe. Right. So no, no, please, also, is you that know, the technical be, manual. It is, isn't it? Yeah. So oh, because of my original. dad, I uh, you know, in '76, he was at the time doing a lot of work for uh, Del Rey Valentine books. Sure. The uh, one of his the art director there, who later ended up going independent, um, was a big fan of my dad, knew I was a science fiction fan. Everyone so was went, a big fan. Uh, you can't say it, <laughs> but we can. Everyone was a big, and this is before, you know, people knew Picasso in the 70s. Right. They knew Van Gogh, you know, yeah. but, you know, people no. knew, like kids and adults knew the Hildebrands. Yeah. I mean, they were rock star celebrity artists. Yes. I mean, well, he was in People magazine. You know, yeah. it, it seems astounding. And I still think it's astounding that that happened. But anyway, yeah. So at the uh, art director at Ballantyne in 76, uh, you know, I was, the, you know, in New York with my dad on a on a business, you know, trip for the time. And uh, the uh, he dropped in my lap. Sweet. You know, I know. That's awesome. Right? Like, and I'm, uh, you know, in awe. Look at that. <laughs> I'm, I'm jealous. I had to buy it with my allowance. Yeah, no, I got it free. You know, like because <laughs> I was a little celebrity. You know, we need and, to and we need to send you a copy of our uh, of our uh, 2023 calendar because okay. uh, it's done in the exact same style that the 1976 Star Trek calendar was. Oh, I didn't pull that out. I have that too. Of course so, you do. Yes. Of course you do. <laughs> yes, I do. I do. Um, so no, what, which is what I'm saying. I'm I'm not a like I I I want to gush my own way because um as i say i was a fan long before the podcast i am a colossal fan of free enterprise no oh, thank you uh, and not like i think all of us that movie spoke to me i actually <laughs> so uh, i i always said that that i that mo when i was watching that movie it felt like someone had been videotaping my life since yeah. childhood <laughs> because, because the scene of fighting that. over captain kirk in grade school was me. I'm like, yeah. what's going on here? Yeah, I, I, I was a, an amazing film. And well, you know. that means a lot because this is actually the when we're recording this, it's the 25th anniversary yep. of our wrapping principal photography. Yep. I mean, I can't believe it's 25 years. I mean, yep. that's insane to me. Yep. Uh, it feels like we did it yesterday, doesn't it, Darren? Yesterday. I mean, really, <laughs> tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow's. I mean, so it blows my mind that it's been 25. Yeah, years, but uh, I'm so grateful to all the people that have kept it alive because, you know, I get this a fair amount. Um, you know, and I know Rob does, and I'm sure Darren does too, people who just love the movie yeah. and um, where it really, and, 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 and I got to experience kind of what some of the Star Trek actors did because, I mean, at Comic Con and different places, people kind of say how it changed, literally changed their lives. And I poo poo it. And then they start to explain, you know, I was a gang or I was failing in yeah. school or yeah. I was this. And, yeah. and I realized there was another way seeing this movie. And it was like, yeah. It just and it's funny, my how, mind. it's funny how often people say, you know, you, you captured uh, me growing up. That's exactly yeah. how it was. But it, yeah. it's all ex explained by Hodgkin's law of parallel development. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> You're right. Wait a minute. So this is the mirror universe? Wait, no. <laughs> Can't prove it. Definitely not. Nobody has a goatee. So yeah, yeah. It may be the 20, no goatees. I did. It for may a while. be the 25th anniversary of Free Enterprise. But it's the 40th anniversary of the Deadly Spawn. It is. It is. Um, <laughs> we're going to so talk about where, that. Where do you want me to start? Uh, because I'd actually, uh, it might be, um, 
I have a fascinating little Star Wars story. That well, I'd let's like start to- with the. Uh, you know, it was, a, it was a very delicate time. Let's start <laughs> long ago and far away, and and we'll st- let's start with Star Wars, and then let's and then we can backtrack to sort of, you know, you growing up as a fan and finding yeah. out who your, uh, you know, your uncle and your dad were, and yeah, you know, well, let's, I let's grew up with, with it from the start, right? So I knew, always knew. Um, so uh, let me. So as as we have discussed um, in, uh, um late 76 and and early 77 you know my my dad was was had a fandom you know he was as we all know he was pretty well known um explain can you explain why he had a fandom i'm sorry Let's right give so people who are younger yes, who may not know may not know um although they do in, in a different he ended up getting a different fandom but so my dad and 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 his brother my uncle uh working um, often together or sometimes separately were pioneering science fiction and fantasy illustrators in the 1970s. Right. And why, what I mean by that is um, they, uh, the style that they painted in um, was realistic. Um, it was highly, it was very painterly. It was um, uh, directly influenced by uh, old masters of illustration like Howard Pyle and, and so on. And, that sort of illustration, those that sort of painting was just not seen in science fiction and fantasy. It was simply, that's not, so they got jobs co- doing book covers and record albums and movie posters, we'll get to that, and in calendars and so on, um, and became particularly famous for illustrating um, uh, several, three years of calendars of the Lord of the Rings. Right. Um, in the Tolkien calendars in 76 and 77 and 78. Um, and uh, those, you know, for a generation of, 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 uh, of, of Tolkien fans became uh, the image uh, that everyone had in their minds. And, and I, it's fair to say that that probably, they were sort of the dominant view of what Tolkien looked like uh, until the Peter Jackson movies. Um, right. That was sort of the default image in everyone's mind. And so, you know. So. And I, I just have to say that uh, everyone looking at uh, any of their paintings, you could absolutely tell that it was them. Yeah. And mm-hmm. partially because of their very controlled palette. Yeah. And they had, they had you know, sort of very compartmentalized uh, palettes for different parts of the illustrations. And it's a very... It's a very interesting thing because, as you said, it, it wasn't it wasn't a technique used for many many years. No, and no. Um, they, it, well, they made it their own because it's all it's almost a hyper real kind of thing. Yeah, uh, very much so. They were um, they were both of them, uh, especially my dad uh, was. Uh, they were huge movie buffs. Mm-hmm. Um, they approached painting as photography. And uh, were at all times conscious of lighting. That was the the, the drama of lighting, uh, the effects of light on on surfaces, and uh, were consciously emulating, as I said, old masters of illustration, but also movies. Like yeah. that's you know they wanted to get produce a cinematic effect on screen, or, or ra- rather on on uh, masonite. Right. <laughs> uh, and and uh, again, yes, it was not known. It was just, that was just really striking at the time, uh, and. So, uh, as my dad said, he made people buy a lot of bad books. Uh, which is fairly <laughs> true. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, but but it you know it, it it powered his career. And and then from then, um, his style uh, increasingly became sort of mainstream. And then uh, certainly by the nineteen eighties, um, you saw a lot of emulation of that style mm-hmm. in book covers and so on. And of course, it, later on in, in uh, role-playing games and sure. uh, board games and so on. And, 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 and that was where he, that's where he got his fan, right? So, but by, in 1977, so he had an established fan base. And as I had said, that he had uh, done work, uh, a lot of advertising work, which is actually kind of his bread and butter throughout the entire career, right? So yeah, he's illustrating the Lord of the Rings, but he's also doing, you know, ads for cat food, right? Because he would do anything. He didn't right. care, right? And, Whatever. And, and it was. people uh, don't realize, or may not realize, that even though this was on virtually every kid's T-shirt throughout the '70s, it was work for hire. He didn't get a piece of that merchandise. Right. <laughs> Let's. We'll get there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I, I'm glad you said that. So uh, that's called foreshadowing. Um, the. <laughs> 
We uh, so in um, late seventy six, uh, yeah, the Star Wars was set to premiere in in seventy seven. But in late seventy six, um, the uh, Lucas, what was then Lucasfilm uh, and twentieth Century Fox, hadn't settled on a movie poster yet. Um, the uh, now it's important to remember that at this time the poster for a movie was a huge part of the marketing campaign. Yeah. Right, like now it's mm -hmm. trivial, but then. That was a single iconic image that was displayed everywhere because that was in every single newspaper in the country, which is how everyone learned what was playing that day. You actually mm -hmm. opened a physical newspaper, you looked at, you know, what was playing and they always showed the movie poster or whatnot. And that was on commercials and that was, that was, that was, so it was an iconic piece of advertising. It was very important to them. Um, and they didn't have one. Well, what a small advertise because this movie was not, um, a big budget film. It's easy to forget that, but Star Wars wasn't. Um, it, it didn't get uh, it didn't get a, a a really big push from 20th Century Fox, but it got a strange one. Small advertising company in New York called up my dad one afternoon and said, uh, "Hey, can you come in? Uh, can you guys come in? Uh, we got a movie poster job for you." And they had done a couple before that. They had done, you know. Um, uh, the uh, a poster that wasn't used for the Barbarella re-release, by the way, <laughs> very strange. Wow. Uh, and, you know, some other minor stuff. But uh, they, they got called in and they said, okay, look, we've got a job for you. It's a science fiction movie. We really don't know much about it. Uh, and then they handed him a big stack of black and white 8 by 10 glossies. Here's some photos from it. Um, well, and, uh, you know, this is the basic elements we want in the poster. Uh, they didn't have any any close-ups of Mark Hamill or Carrie Fisher or whatnot, and and my my dad asked why, and he said, "Oh, you don't worry about it. Everybody in this movie is unknown, and and it doesn't matter because this movie is terrible, and no one is going to see it. So just don't worry about it." Okay, yeah, great. Okay, so he goes home, comes back, and uh, the, there's only one wrinkle to this job is that we want this as soon as humanly possible. We would like this tomorrow. If you can, can you do this tomorrow? Well, I don't know. As soon as possible. Okay. So he comes home, uh, the next morning, uh, he was driving me to school. I was nine. And, uh, and of course, as you, you know, I'd already been to a science fiction, uh, convention. I'd already been to sure. a Star Trek convention. So I was a huge science fiction and fantasy fan. And as a nine year old boy, and, I was the target audience for this movie. Of course, no one no one knew that at the time, but it was me. Anyway, so he's driving me to school, and he had that he had that big stack of black and white glossies, and he handed them over to me and said, "Here, Charles. Yesterday, I got this job for a movie poster for science fiction. Look at this." And so I started looking through the photos. Right, and they, these were uh, mostly on set photography, uh, almost all like publicity stills, almost no effect shots. I think there might have been like one of the Millennium Falcon and, uh, you know, one of a TIE fighter chasing, mm -hmm. a, a chasing an X-wing, but, but almost nothing. Um, and, <laughs> and I said, wow, okay. And, and, and my dad said, I, you know, I don't really know much about this movie at all. I, they, they tell me it's terrible, but, uh, I, I they have some really weird characters in it. It's something called Chewbacca, somebody named Darth Vader. I had no idea, right? Nobody had any idea. So, and, but like I said, they tell me it was terrible. And, and I was paging through the photos and I said, Dad, uh, I don't know. It looks pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so an early positive review for Star Wars. Uh, so um, he does the poster. It wasn't like, wasn't 24 hours, but it was close. It was like 36 hours. And uh, done, sent in, right? And again, this is just like one of many jobs. Like it, this week, it's this movie poster for this terrible science fiction film. Next week, I'm going to be working back on the cat food and then, you know, maybe another bad book cover, whatever. So it wasn't special. Um, but, but then something weird happened, like mm, two weeks later, uh, the advertising agency called back and said, okay, great. It's great. Fox loves the movie poster. They think it's great, but could just come in. We have a couple of changes that you have to make. Now, of course, mm -hmm. this is an acrylic painting. So they actually had to go in physically and paint sure. on it. Very strange, right? Like no Photoshop, but that's really how it's done. And so they added, <laughs> at the time, there were no uh, R2 and 3PO in, in right. the poster. Um, so they added that in. And then they add one more change. 
could you make your name bigger on the poster, that prominent, oh, the brand that you see over there? Because you see, remember, this movie is terrible, so poor Star Wars needs all the help it can get, and maybe somebody will go see this movie because it says Hildebrand on the poster, you know, because God help us, this thing, please, it's never going to be anything. Okay, so he does, you know, at this point, he really believes this is a terrible movie, right? Like, because, oh my God, they, they want my name on the poster? Think that's going to sell tickets? Fine. <laughs> All right. So he does it. It's done. Many months pass. And, you know, mostly I've forgotten about this, right? You know, right. I, I had, you know, other than seeing it like in Star in Starlog magazine, you know, I, I didn't really pay much attention because none of us did. But then in May, um, we get the advertising, that same advertising agency sends us tickets in the mail for the New York premiere. And this is the, uh, this is a little different than, you have to remember, this is 77, right? So there are no, uh, there's no AMC, there's no Regal Cinemas, right? Like, you know, there there's a bazillion little theater chains everywhere in the country and some guy who owns 10 and a guy who owns five and whatever. And so for a lot of those, a lot of films, um, but nothing was, it wasn't pre-booked. What they did was they have a showing and, you know, those, those agents, theatrical booking agents would come to the showing and, and mm -hmm. recommend, yeah, you should take it or yeah, you shouldn't. Well, this was that showing, right? We got mm -hmm. tickets to that showing in New York. Um, yeah, so this is before blind booking, we yeah. had to show the film to the exhibitors. You had to show the film to the exhibitors with, with some exceptions, like, like if it, you know, if it had a superstar or whatever, it was right. a Paul Newman movie. Okay, fine. Right. But again, Star Wars, who cares? It's nothing. Well, anyway, so they sent, they, they sent us four tickets. And um, so me, my mom, and my dad went three, and uh, we have one. <laughs> wow. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, so, uh, okay. Now, this was, uh, it was in a giant theater in Times Square, which I think was open, still running until like 2010. Um, it was, yeah, this it was probably the Lowe's Astor Plaza. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah, I, I don't. That's probably what it was. Yeah. That's where um, was I like, think Empire and Jedi played. Yeah, it, this is. It was like three levels below the subways. It was a super deep underground thing. It was gigantic, and you know, I got okay. So now um, it's May, and I'm ten, and uh, I obviously I'd never been to a movie premiere before, nothing like this. And so we we file into the to the premiere, and of course it's a very strange situation because there's you know there's no there's no trailers or anything. It's just like, it's just a huge empty theater. Everyone sits down and on every single seat in the theater, there was a booklet. Yeah. 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 Which, um, yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you've seen these before, but mm -hmm. it's, I have it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Right. So they were distributing these up into that first week. Yeah, again, so what Fox Charles is showing us is the program book. Yeah. I'm sorry. Star this Wars. is the, yeah, this is a program book. Um, that is very extensive, um, describing the backstory of Star Wars, the names of characters, pronunciation guides, which right. is really funny, um, and uh, all lavishly produced because 20th Century Fox was terrified that nobody would be able to understand this. Yeah, and at press screenings, they used to give you like a card with the credits on the back, but yeah. this was this was like the kind yeah. of program books you could buy in the theater, which was popular yeah. in the 70s and 80s. Right, and right. they also did have that card Right, with the credit list, credits. which Charles is showing us now, which is a it's card stock that folds over with all the credits and the logo on the front. Yeah. So and both of those are sitting on the no episode four, no a new no 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 <laughs> no this there never was yeah so right um so you know and it it, it was uh, that was sitting on the on every single seat in the theater right so we I, yeah. I sit down I'm paging through this thing I was really exciting right and of course the movie just starts there's no no trailers no yeah. ads no popcorn whatever. It just starts. And of course, it starts with John Williams music. And, you know, da, 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 da. the Star Destroyer is flying over, blasting at the rebel ship. And the theater goes wild. Everybody's like, oh, whoa, whoa, like, what's going on? You can feel it, right? And, you know, the, everybody's behind it. And behind, by, you know, everybody's whooping and cheering and yeah. And when the Death Star blows up, there's yeah, explosions and everybody's happy. And, and by the end, the credits roll and people are applauding the screen. People, but the people are an audience full of New York City area theatrical booking agents, the most right. cynical audience humanly possible, right? Mm -hmm. And they're just loving it. Right. 
So I remember we were, we were filed out of the theater. They smell money. They smell money. They sure <laughs> did. Well, so what happened was we filed out of the theater, right? And he, this thing, as I said, was like two levels down. And like you went up one level of escalators, and that was where, you know, the, uh, the concession stands are. But that's where all the phone booths were. Uh, and for younger people uh, listening, uh, a phone booth <laughs> is uh, like a cell phone that's stuck to a wall in a public place, and you have to pay to use it. So. <laughs> and anyway, so there are phone booths. And they, all the agents are lined up, right, waiting to use the phone. And I'm wa we walk by, and I actually hear them saying, oh, take it. Take it for as long as you can. Take it. Oh take it at all. Oh, yes. Great. And then, um, so then we're going up one last set of escalators, right, to the ground floor to finally get out of the theater. And they had ushers with huge white plastic buckets handing out, may the force be with you buttons. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> You look. You got a pin that says "May the Force Be With You," and there it is. Yeah, I got, I got everything. So, and yeah. soon after, they were handing out buttons that said "Darth Vader" spelled wrong. Oh, I didn't know that. Really? Yeah. V a d a r. Oh, wow. oh neat. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> Typos are cool. That's yeah. how my that dad pronounced it in that. Yeah, Vader. 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 That's what how he said it in the in the car. So that's interesting. I wonder. I don't know what that's about. Funny. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe, yeah. Change. Well, Who tell us about that, that conversation. Anyway. All right. So let me, yeah. So we <laughs> foreshadowed it. So let's keep the, going. The horrible movie that you went to see. It was terrible. Yeah. So this terrible movie. So of course, yeah. So, you know, a week later, it's the biggest movie of all times. Giant success. Great. Um, so, which is wonderful. And it was, and, and my dad loved it. He loved the movie, right? He, we thought he was as taken and in, in raptured by it as anybody, right? It was kind of everything he had dreamed of when he was a young fan of science fiction in the 1950s come to life right sure. there it was um anyway so i it's probably a month goes by maybe more and my dad was back again in new york manhattan he's walking by uh the main uh dalton bookstore um right on fifth avenue and displayed in the window right is that poster right right of course and it's for sale Right, because they're selling posters of it. Like, okay, and my dad's like smiling. Oh, that's cool. You know, it's my poster. You know, he walks along. He's, he takes in a few steps, and then he says, "Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I never signed a copyright release. I never signed anything." It's true. He had never signed anything because this movie was terrible. Who cares? Doesn't matter. They never got him to. Here's the money. Go away. Forget it. And they didn't do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, <laughs> Okay, now we got to skip ahead a little bit. So I am a lawyer. Specifically, I am a copyright and trademark and media and entertainment lawyer. Okay. <laughs> but I was 10 in 1977 and not a lawyer. Very experienced lawyer at the time. Yeah, no, I didn't. Yeah, it wasn't really my forte at the time. But so I was 10 years old. And then my I hear, you know, I'm on the. I, I I love Star Wars as much as anybody, but then I I hear my parents on the phone and talking to lawyers, and I hear about words about copyright and infringement and and releases and contract and promissory estoppel and so on and and like so on. So yes, they did attempt to to raise the issue and 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 retained a law firm uh, to pursue it, but what. You know, I was 10, so I couldn't advise them. I didn't, they didn't know what sort of ironclad, astoundingly ironclad case they had. And so they, they didn't get what they should have gotten had I been representing them. <laughs> <laughs> if you remember, kids. so ill prepared at the time. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I think so, the lesson of this is that it is ne you are never too young to benefit from law school. I right. think is the lesson. <laughs> is this sort of like your your Batman Bruce Wayne origin story? It is. That is why I ended up in. How could I not? Yeah. Right? I that is how that. I ended up in law school. I, 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 there was no other path for me. Right? Like it's impossible. And yes, it is my Batman Bruce Wayne experience. That's amazing. Now that is wild. <laughs> it's interesting because <laughs> yeah. I I uh, became friends with. Tom Jung, the uh, artist who did the original original poster oh. based based on um, you know based on he was doing a version of Frazetta. Frazetta, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and in his contract, he did delineate that it wasn't to be sold. So that's why they 
they went to your dad and, and uncle. Fascinating. And then uh, and then yeah, screwed I, it up because the, they didn't actually get that. They didn't yeah, get a contract uh, for that. On, on the basis that, well, George wasn't very happy with that original version. He wanted something a little more comic booky. Oh, yep. yeah. That yep. was their story. Yeah. But, but it was in, in reality, fact because they wanted they better wanted merchandise. something that wasn't this is, ironclad. This is amazing. I've yeah. never heard that before. Yeah. And now I own part two of what of, now I know more <laughs> from what I, what I learned here. Because I talked with him about this and I have one of those programs that he signed to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's it's fascinating that the the problems that artists have dealing with uh, the people with the money. Well, yeah, I know. Uh, it, 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 it is true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's no way around it. It is it, absolutely true. One of the things, though, is that it's um, it, it, it's yep. You know, of course, over the years, Fox, Lucasfilm, and now Disney, you know, have made a mint with of course that. But what's wonderful about it is that you know, wait, let me show you something. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he has stepped away from the computer and uh, is bringing something Goodbye, back. Computer. We don't know what it is. So, um, and he's back. He's back. So. I, uh, this was just convenient. You know, my daughter was just the right age when this happened. You know, every so often there's new merchandise that comes out with that. Sure. You know, the poster on it, right? And, and my dad, my daughter was um, in just in second grade and they came out with, you know, a lunchbox. Oh, oh man. <laughs> and, and perfect. And especially because, right, the lunchbox says Hildebrandt, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, Brilliant. You know, Amazing. Vivian, yep. I got you a lunchbox with your name on it. <laughs> How awesome is that? <laughs> That's so great. What he just showed us was a, a lunchbox yeah. that has that key, the original key art that uh, Greg and Tim did. Um, and it says Hildebrandt signed on the artwork. That is and, so great. And just so that you know that the, that the, uh, the, let's say stinginess wasn't necessarily directed just at your, at your uncle and dad. Um, oh no! Uh, during during the uh, early pre production on Return of the Jedi, Ralph McQuarrie finally got an agent. Yeah, and yeah. Lucas's Lucas's remark was, "Oh well, I guess we'll have to start paying him something then." Yeah, I you know this Jesus. is so true. I, uh, Mar uh, uh, <laughs> this goes <laughs> kind of back to where we started with, which was the uh, the where. Artists in science fiction and fantasy got no got no respect. Right. Um, mm. uh, up, you know, because unfortunately, the those with the money understood that they enjoyed it too much. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, Absolutely. that's a good point. Well, I got to ask you because you know both <laughs> Ashley and myself, we've been part of writing teams at uh, some points in our career, and people always sure. say to us. Oh, uh, you know, how do you divide the divisional labor? How does that work as a writing team, right? Yeah. So my question to you is, how did Tim and Greg work together as an art artist team? Uh, yeah. That to me just blows my mind. <laughs> um, so uh, it, uh, it actually turned out to be pretty simple. Um, the uh, They would discuss uh, sort of overall composition together. Um, they would uh, come, you know, the, the basic composition of whatever the image would be. Uh, or yeah, and then uh, they specialized. So um, if it was mostly an environmental painting, um, mostly you know um, images of a of, of the environment, of of buildings, of of uh, trees and brooks and whatnot, that was my dad's specialty. Mm. And if it was mostly characters, you know, mostly just humans and very little else, that was Greg's specialty. Mm. And they both did both. But right. like that was their specialization, mm -hmm. and so they—that's basically how they divided it up oh, by and cool. large. Um, although you know, sometimes, especially later when they were working on things like the Marvel collector cards in the 1990s, there was just so much work that they couldn't specialize. It was like, right. okay, you do these hundred cards, and I'm doing these hundred cards. Right. And that's, yeah. That was the yeah. end of it. There was really no way around it. That's uh, fascinating but, because because you know painting is is, is usually a very lone uh, activity. It, so well, it was the ability to break that up and and keep something afterwards that looks like something cohesive is absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, he yeah, uh, they they did it. Um, yeah, they uh, and, and to be fair, you know, like it was um, uh, most of their 
physical painting work, right? Literally sitting at an easel and right. you know, desk in my dad's case, um, uh, was done was solitary, right? Like there, right. the collaborative aspect of it was largely earlier in, in the planning, planning and yeah, yeah. Understood. That's that's a fascinating process. Do you yeah. think the fact that they had pursued this litigation maybe is why they didn't do more Star Wars going forward? Oh no. So they got invited back. Um, so they uh, they <laughs> uh, they were asked to do the movie poster for uh, Empire. Yeah, right. and they turned it down. Um, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> um, because they were convinced they had something way better themselves. Sure, ah, 1979. Yes. Yeah. Oh, boy. So, yeah, uh, catapulted okay. on the strength of the Tolkien calendars and now the Star Wars poster and then even and uh, 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 the Sword of Shannara. Actually, the Sword of Shannara was, is a um, uh, uh, an important part of this story. Uh, the my dad and my uncle decided. Well, we can do our own sword and sorcery sure. fantasy universe. What's the, no problem? <laughs> um, and you know, in their defense, uh, the the sword of Shinara was a big. I don't know if you guys have read it, but the sword of Shinara was yeah. a big hit. It remains to be this day. But it it is. I don't think anybody would dispute that the first book is just a point for point retelling of the Lord of the Rings. It's not, there's nothing original in it, right? Mm -hmm. And my dad and uncle illustrated it. And based on that, they were, they got sort of convinced, well, anyone can do this, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and apparently folks at Bantam Books were also convinced that anybody could do this. So they right. ended up backing uh, the creation of this, um, which is a lavishly illustrated both black and white in color, short and sorcery fantasy novel, Tolkien esque, we would call it today. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, uh, a quest story of a dark lord uh, seeking to take over a fantasy kingdom. I mean, what do you want, right? Something um, completely different. Yeah, yeah. To yeah. But totally different. Completely different. Yeah. Don't you understand? Yeah, mm -hmm. obviously. These aren't, these aren't orcs. No, <laughs> they're borks. Yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> they're not orcs. But uh, so they were uh, this, yeah, again, I, this is a weird time. It, this was a fairly big success sure. at mm -hmm. the time. You know, again, th there wasn't a lot of stuff out there if you were a science fiction and fantasy fan. It, it, it's certainly not stuff of that lavish. It was slim, slim Pickens. Slim Pickens, right? So mm -hmm. uh, it was a big hit book. Okay, well, this pile on that, the big hit book said, well, we should make a movie, <laughs> right? That's obviously the next step. Why not? We should do this. And so my dad and my uncle, with the backing of Bantam, they they were just as naive, decided that this should be easy. We'll just get a movie made. <laughs> okay. As you do. In the world of 1978 and 79, before CGI, and, and, you know, somehow the plan was that they were going to make a gigantic sword and sorceries, Lord of the Rings style spectacle film with giant marching armies of orcs. I'm sorry, yeah. not orcs. No. Uh, att attacking castles and, and whatnot, and that was going to be financially viable. Here right. come the dorks. Here come the dorks. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes. laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, the, so, so, they, my parents, but mostly Bantam, invested in the creation of a colossal multimedia presentation um, of slides, some limited animation, lots of photography. Imagine a sort of lavish Ken Burns movie, right? Right, okay. yeah, yeah. Except all in color right. with voiceover narration. It's about 30 minutes long and explaining a cut down version of the story of this book, which by the way, is not like it's not particularly complicated to begin with. Um, the reason this, the reason this works so well is because, uh, as I said, my dad and uncle, but particularly my dad were, were colossal movie fans. And it was sort of their, their motivating guide from day one. Of course. When they started this project, they didn't start with a story outline or with a script or even, you know, a, even a plot idea outline, they made storyboards. Yeah. 
they actually produced storyboards, hundreds and hundreds of individual illustrations to make to storyboard a whole movie um, uh, uh, for Ursharak. Uh, not no dialogue, <laughs> but but right. plenty of imagery, right. um, and so <laughs> that's what they were doing when they got the call to do Empire and then turned it down because pshaw, yeah. yeah. So because they were that's too busy kind of with their plan. epic new franchise. We're too busy with something that's way big. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But they wow. they did do some they did do some work later on in the nineties for yep. Lu Lucasfilm. Yeah. Uh, so uh, whatever happened there, and and I, whatever happened in seventy seven, uh, certainly was quickly forgotten. There were yeah. there were no hard feelings. And yes, uh, in the nineteen nineties, they got uh, they were contacted in connection with the release of the Phantom Menace. Right, there was a giant merchandising push. And well, actually, a little bit before that, before um, they that, did um, the, the Shadows was, of the Empire exactly art yeah, yeah, yeah. set. Uh, well, that, Zizor, who knew that? That's yeah, right. Zizor. That that yep. Millennium Falcon is from that set. Yeah. Um, the uh, yeah, I had a bunch more, obviously, but uh, yes. So they were contacting with that. They did. A, they did. They were part of that. They did. You know, like uh, Star Trek fan magazine covers and so on. But then, in connection with the Phantom Menace, they got. A, you know, they did a lot. Uh, yeah, they illustrated. Yeah, uh, children's uh, pop up book and a coloring book and that sort of stuff. Like you know, there was a flood of stuff that came out as we all remember. It's, it's it's interesting that legal action. The, doesn't uh, put you on their no list. It puts you on their we should take these people seriously list. It certainly yeah. did in that case. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Uh, it, it also may have been, you know, the uh, uh, it, it may have been. I, I can only speculate here. Sure, but the the cause of action that they had was against Twentieth Century Fox, mm -hmm. right. right? Right, not Lucasfilm, right? Yeah. So it. You know, and by the time Empire came along, obviously Lucas is making it himself. He's yeah, backing right. it with his own funds. So, you know, maybe he he never cared, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or had anything to do with it. Or had anything yeah. to do with yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Except yeah. Oh, well, no, he did say make their name bigger, right? <laughs> Put your name well, bigger on that, the post. And and that's kind of what happened with Galactica too, where it was 20th yeah. Century Fox suing over Galactica in 78, not Lucasfilm. Yeah. Right. So my dad, okay, so, the, you know, my dad had the most bizarre career. So he had a weird connection to Battlestar Galactica, too. Um, so, again, in connection with this, right? Um, he scouted out, you know, who's going to do the effects for Ursharak, right? Right. And naturally, John Dykstra was high on his list. Right. John Dykstra was, was interested. So he went out for a meeting with John Dykstra while Dykstra was shooting Galactica. Right. In, in you know, and and specifically he was there on a day where they were they, well, he didn't, he wasn't a fan of Galactica, but but it well, what I later kind of figured out, they were shooting Gun on Ice Planet Zero. Oh, of course. Oh wow. At the time. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but yeah, he got, you know, they took him on a tour of the set, they showed him the, all the models and 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 everything. Uh, but yeah, so that's right. fascinating. Uh, it, 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 this was a, just a crazy thing. I mean, it was so strange. Um, at one point they got a meeting with Joseph E. Levine and, mm. and, and, and who watched this presentation for 30 minutes and said, you know, okay. I love that. That's really cool, but that's going to be two hundred million dollars. Yeah, and two hundred million nineteen seventy eight dollars. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. So we're talking. You know, this yeah. is a billion dollar movie. Yeah, J James Cameron didn't exist yet. Jim, as you say, yeah, <laughs> like, like, which now is a low budget yeah. film, but then yeah, right. no, that was that was unacceptable. And, yeah, and his super eight <laughs> movies cost that, but um, yeah, no, that's, yeah. That's, so it was that, just impossible. That, and it, it, you know, uh, but I I don't know. Is this any crazier than? You know, like Yodorowsky's Dune as a project. No, absolutely right. no, nothing yeah. is crazier than Yodorowsky's Dune. <laughs> yeah. Right? How I think so. And then how so that's what Deadly <laughs> Spawn come about? At what point did? Be okay, so this all collapsed, right? Right. This went nowhere. Right. Much sound and fury. All signifies nothing. And uh, my dad is still just dreaming of being a movie maker because at the end of the day, he really didn't want to be an artist. He wanted to make movies. That's what that everybody wants dream. to be something else. You everybody, it's top is guy in your field, and you still want to be doing something yeah. else. The writers want to direct. The artists want to be producers. I mean, yeah. well, the, and the directors want to act. And, and yeah, 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 and, yeah. And, yeah, absolutely, all true. Well, and here it was. So he really wanted to be a movie producer, director, whatever, and. and, and and he was, he just, that was what he wanted to do. And 
So very soon, um, right, right around 1980, um, 79, 80, right about the same time as this fell apart, my dad was at a tiny little science fiction convention in, uh, you know, I was a guest in, uh, in New York, um, you know, met up with some other folks who were want to be low budget filmmakers. And in, you know, it was like a, it was like one of those you know, Mickey Rooney musicals. Uh, hey, we can show, save yeah. the whole town. We'll put on sure. the big show ourselves. Mm -hmm. Let's make a movie. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you, <laughs> um, and that's what happened. So, uh, my dad, you know, again, through his basically through convention contacts, uh, linked up with uh, young, hungry special effects artists and some New York theatrical folks and put it all together and decided, let's make a low budget science fiction horror film. Sure. And they did. <laughs> So uh, it's actually astounding that it got made, but uh, but it's true they did uh, very slowly. So shooting on, but it's not astounding that it got made. It's astounding that it got released. Oh yeah, well, oh my god, right? So that was another piece of luck that's it's just amazing. So it was um, uh, right. So shooting at night, not on weekends, mostly in our house, right? As the as the venue to be invaded. Uh, uh, they made we made a horror film. Um, so I I got yeah, the your I got the gig as the as the lead kid. Yeah. Um, you know I was gonna I was available. <laughs> <laughs> you were still your, working on your law and degree. Your agent was very but, reasonable. <laughs> my agent was very reasonable. I was still working on my law degree. Yeah, that's right. Same same deal, right? Like I should have gotten more <laughs> if I had been representing <laughs> me at that time. <laughs> I would have driven a harder bargain. But huh. but nevertheless, well, this led to slowly. When I was in essentially seventh and eighth grade, um, we made a movie, and uh, I, you know, it, 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 again, it, it was a it's a labor of love. Nobody got paid at all. Everyone did it for a, a piece of the action, right? Mm -hmm. um, a very small. <laughs> and, Your Star Trek uh, bona fides are. I got it. Yeah. Settled. Yeah, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I didn't. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> when I, when Adam Nimoy came to my convention that I was helping to run, I didn't get to do my Nimoy to him. I was, oh. I was so disappointed, but um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so we got made and yes, this was right before video recorders became universal and right before there, the direct to video as a concept really existed. So lots of movies that today would never get a theatrical release were still at that time released to the theater. And so this fantastically cheap, I think the actual out of pocket costs were about $30,000 in, you know, 1981 dollars. So let's call it right. 60 or 70 grand today. Mm. Um, at most. That was the out-of-pocket cost for the production, and uh, this got a theatrical release. We got a, we, and, uh, and one of the weird. So it was a small distribution company called Twenty First Century, right? But who offered it the best deal, right? In terms of like you know, we give you this percentage and so on. But what is weirder to me is that also in the bidding to release it was Paramount. Mm. Uh, like what? Now, but they wanted too much, and so we, you know, I, not me, but the producers ended up going with with the with the small uh, small distributor. Okay, it was released, and it was, you know, it's so strange. Uh, it was released in the new, it released regionally, right? Nobody could pay for, you know, a, 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 a national release. You know. The Corman model of bicycling prints around the country. Yes, absolutely, bicycling prints around the country. God help you. How many scratches are on that prince when it reaches Nebraska, right? Like, yeah, I don't know. yeah, exactly. Well, that works. But, but anyway, New York got released first, and it premiered in Times Square. And on my 16th birthday, <laughs> I I went into Times Square and I saw my name, <laughs> theatrical marquee, nice. walked in and sat down in the theater. Saw my name on the screen and heard the audience applaud while I was 16 years old. Okay. And that is not the most amazing thing that happened because the next weekend, when it was got a general release in the New York area, it played in the town where I was going to high school. Right. <laughs> so there's a Saturday night, right? And uh, we'll walk into the theater and sitting down. 
and I'm 16 years old, sophomore in high school, and it's filled with everybody, all my friends and everybody from high school. And there, my name comes on the screen, says, starring Charles George Hildebrand, and everybody's cheering, you know, like, whoa, okay, right? Like, pretty amazing. Um, I, uh, it was, I, I, I didn't have anything to compare it to, right? Like, yeah. at, at some level, I did think it was absolutely really cool, but I had no idea how probably warping that experience was. Like, I mean, I gotta say, like, <laughs> it's not all, Star Wars. Well, yeah, I mean, like all all teenagers think they're great, but you know, I had objective proof. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially when Jenny Agater called and said, "How can we work together now?" Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when like, when is she squad. calling? Like, what is that going <laughs> to happen? Uh, so yeah, no, it was it was and it was great fun, right? Like, it was amazing fun. I was on, you know. Live at five and 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 all kinds of wild and the commercial stuff. was on all the time, all the time, right? Yeah. The the movie real science fiction fans have been waiting for, yeah, the um, deadly spawn. <laughs> and it was you know it's funny because it was it was again this is a case of like it was even though Charles it was is so holding up fantastic films, the Starlog right. wannabe of the era, yeah, the Starlog wannabe with you know the deadly spawn there, like yeah. and it was it, you know it was amazing that this low budget thing you know. Again, People Magazine, mm -hmm. yeah, the Deadly Spawn, right? Like, I mean, it it was it was so strange, and it became like there were yeah. Here's the LP record album. Wow! Oh goodness. yeah, that's Sweet. awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, you know, and it acquired a fandom, right? That persists to this day. It has had th two DVD releases, uh, one Blu-ray release, and another one is coming. Wow. Um, it, it, in four K. In 4K, glorious 4K. It's really not <laughs> going to look any better, you know. But yeah, um, uh, I don't know. Uh, but you know, I mean, the, the I don't. There are so many. I, I forgot. The, 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 John Dodds was the effects director. Who he and I remained friends the whole time since then. I actually talked to him all the time. He's the guy who designed and built the actual monsters. Sure, he went on to your a, house. Yeah, he, he went on to a major career in in um, film and, and particularly Broadway. Uh, mm -hmm. He ended up doing the makeups for the Beauty and the Beast Disney stage show for oh, many well, years. There you so, go. Yeah, but um, he, he, I think he tried to keep track of it at one point. I think there have been forty different video releases in every conceivable language all around the world. It's so weird. Uh, and did you guys ever see a dime? Oh yes, I made nearly a thousand dollars. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Again, my representation was terrible. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> and but, how did your um, dad feel after the movie opened? Was he like he was anxious to do more? Right. He was. Uh, it was. It was so odd. He uh, remember, as I said, this was what he really wanted to do, yeah. and yeah. and it. Ended up being the thing he was most proud of in his life. Oh, like, wow. it was Including so odd, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, at least I'm connected oh, to it, right? Like, <laughs> it's all the same thing. And, yeah. and yeah, no, he loved it. And yes, he wanted to do more. Um, uh, yeah. he, uh, you know, that didn't happen. Um, I'm, you know, a lot of different reasons. Uh, I think, uh, part of it in a big way, as you can just see from things like that crazy half hour multimedia presentation. Um, my dad, for all of his love of movies, never really made a serious effort to try and you know, like figure out the system and work with right, people sure. and yeah, yeah, learn yeah. how movies are made for real and any right. of that. You know, he didn't do that. Um yeah. So it was just the way it was. So but yeah. he went on and did some glorious one sheets. I mean Secret of Nim, Secret of Nim. stunning. Beautiful. Well that was 82. And then of yep. course um he did the, the one for Clash of the Titans. Uh, yep. That's that's great. Yep. Um, you know, yep. and and did some just gorgeous. I mean, and that's and that's only the one sheets, obviously. Uh, oh yeah, no, I, and, those, yeah. and those are iconic, right? Secret of Nim was a particular love of his because uh, he, when he was very young, he wanted to be a Disney animator. Like that mm -hmm. was animation was his first love of movies, right? That's what made him made him love movies, and so you know, he really bonded with Don Bluth personally. Sure. Um, in, in terms of what Bluth was trying to do at that time. This yeah, is before sure. the Disney Renaissance. So Disney was producing a lot of craptastic stuff. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, the Black the, Cauldron. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, oh, I was thinking the, more like, yeah. Right, right. The Aristocats. Man? 
It's the, the Aristocats. Condorman. It's the AAA uh, Society, the Abused Artists Association. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Mauschwitz. Yeah. Mauschwitz. Oh my God. I always yeah. heard. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's, what yeah. they, that's what they called Disney at the time. Yeah. Some um, people probably still do. I'm sure, yeah, for, but for different reasons now. But yeah, yeah. Um, the, so so he, yeah, he, that that meant a lot to him. He was really he was really taken by that. So yeah, I know I, it, it was astounding, and then, you know all of that. Um, and the he, he at the same time he round about the same time, um, you know I I was a gamer. Uh, I have been my whole life, and I, I was an early ad- adoptee of Dungeons and Dragons. Sure. And uh, so he, uh, he, I brought that to his notice, <laughs> and and this is a and he he my mom actually contacted DSR, what was then the 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 rights holder for Dungeons and Dragons, and he ended up having a, something of a successful mini career doing. Um, Dungeons and Dragons calendar yeah. in mm-hmm. the early eighties, and, and was that a direct result of all the uh, claim for his Tolkien work in the seventies? Absolutely, and- yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because the same people who were, you know, at this point, art directors at TSR right. were, you know, had been fans of everything back to the yeah, of course, the, yeah. The calendars. So yeah, he and he'll, and then I guess like the final phase of his career was the uh, was comic books, like in, in starting in the nineteen nineties. He started to do Marvel stuff, things like right. the vast numbers of collector cards and and um, uh, yeah, posters, promotional posters, lots of uh, comic book one-off covers, sometimes whole comic books. I think I've got something here. <laughs> um, and, uh, and at, at one point, um, he was even doing a um, uh, he was even doing a daily strip uh which was terry and the pirates in the late oh yeah movie. wow indicated yeah um so he really got into that that's yeah. fascinating what what an amazing body of work yeah I mean, and and consistently great yeah you mm-hmm. know, no no matter what they were doing yeah um, it, my dad was um it was interesting to see him so he uh, he was obviously a huge science fiction and fantasy fan for sure, sure right but and and Given everything else being equal, he would certainly rather be doing a painting of, you know, a dragon or something right. like that. But he was a consummate professional in that if he was back to doing the cat food, right, he still put 100% into that. Yeah. And every was, freaking whisker is there, baby. Every whisker is there. <laughs> but he would, he'd always be like studying, okay, well, the light's going to reflect off the can this way. Yeah, and right. it's going to cause an ambient reflection from this. So that, and he really could do that. And that's why it all had that level of quality. Because of does yes. the apple fall far from the tree? Do you have any artistic talent or are you I, just a legal eagle? No, <laughs> I dabble. Um, so, uh, but the, I, I do, I, 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 I do. Uh, and uh, it, I, <laughs> my, I dabble, I, I like it, but um, the difference is I am the opposite of my dad. Like, like I'm only interested in in it if it's something I care about. Like, I'm not right. going to paint a can of cat food. It's, it's right. too hard. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> if I were to do that, I'd write a contract. That's exactly. <laughs> stupid. Yeah. Um, so, no, I do. I, I, well, it was funny. I, I don't do much of it, but, but when I do, it's funny. Like, we were, my, Family, I have um, my wife and I have two daughters, and and we were at a uh, YMCA family camp type thing, um, you know, last year. It's one of these mountain yeah, picture Friday the Thirteenth, a mountain lakeside <laughs> camp where oh, a real family <laughs> atmosphere. Okay, yeah, very wholesome family Moms atmosphere. Are very important. In, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I figure as a veteran horror star. <laughs> I am safe in that environment. I know what to do. And so anyway, they uh well, you know, part of the, you know, they have the usual activities of canoeing and whatnot. And and then a big part of this camp had one of those paint your own pottery things, right? Whatever. And and I didn't do that very much, but uh, I have occasionally done it in the past. But what happened was that one of the paint your own pottery things was this cool dragon. It was perched on this globe. And yeah, you know, Beth and and the kids were like, "Oh, let's do one." So I grabbed. Okay, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do this one. Okay. So, all right, I started. Now everybody else, they're just painting in the way you're. Yeah, I guess everybody paints it. They just painted flat colors. But I'm like, well, no, 
I got to shade this in 3D. Yeah. I got to paint it like a Hildebrandt painting, yeah, right? The bounce lights uh, coming off the mountain. The bounce lights <laughs> coming up the thing. Like, okay, okay. So, so I did, right? Like, oh, so I started building up the layers, and you know, I mean, this is trans. The wings are translucent here, so it's got to be lighter. Whatever. And then slowly, over three days, like everybody in the in the paint your own pottery zone in the hobby you. area, they all start crowding around my. My oh my table and what I like oh, what are you an artist and I said no my dad was an artist <laughs> I, I, I might on TV <laughs> oh man well I gotta say Charles this has been fantastic I'm so glad that you joined us on the show because uh what amazing memories and a testimonial to your your dad who was just obviously <laughs> so special to you but so special to fans of the genre and yes. uh it's just really, um, it's really and, great. And, I, great and I want to repeat something I, to Mark, I, I, I think I emailed you this, but I uh, got to say this out loud. My dad was a huge fan of Free Enterprise. Um, yeah, I, I love I, that. Only when, he could have done the one sheet. Oh uh, my yes. God, I know, I wish. I, he uh, would have done it. He would have loved it. Um, uh, so it's actually, so what happened there, you know, I loved that movie from the first moment I saw it and, and I, which was, you know, I was running on cable in the nineties constantly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I called up my dad and I said, dad, you know, you got to watch this film. It's on Cinemax or whatever. And, and no, and it, was, it was actually, this is interesting. I think it was on HBO. Then it was on Showtime, Showtime. and then it was on sci-fi channel. It's like, it, it hit for the cycle. I saw it on Showtime. I'm sure I saw it on Showtime. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Uh, so I, I called him up and I said, you know, I, I, I started to describe it to him. And he said, oh, you mean that movie about the two guys who meet William Shatner in the bookstore? That film is hilarious. Oh my God. <laughs> and he started talking about, oh, my God, the musical Julius Caesar. It's great. Wow. <laughs> he loved it. Uh, 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 oh, that, oh, that's great. That's Especially, awesome. you know, with the anniversary. But, you know, like yeah. I said, I, I had, a, a, a you know, his a poster. Uh, the poster, like many people on my wall growing up, uh, I, I I love that poster. I mean, I have a lot of the D and D and the Lord of the Rings stuff, and so that just gives me such joy to hear. And I I you know watched the Deadly Spawn at least once on VHS. There you go, at least <laughs> once. At least once. So and, and yes, absolutely. I was gonna, yeah, so like the continuing the continuing presence of that poster like this is just from last year yeah this yeah. is time magazine wow. yeah 45th time magazine anniversary cover. tribute to star wars with the hildebrand painting on the cover yeah wow you know I, astounding now, here's the thing that sticks with me um and i have to ask you about it because it's just been tickling the back of my brain since you said it mm -hmm. you mentioned that your dad said you know that uh he felt like he had sold a lot of crappy books to people yeah and what I'm curious about is, did he ever say, like, which one haunted him? Which one kept him up at night? What's the worst thing that he did to the public? <laughs> the Sword of Shannara. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> really? No. Uh, 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 so, yeah, he, he, he was, that's, again, that's what led to Urshirak. He, he, was, he was so cynical. And, uh, you know, it was just a rip off of the Lord of the Rings. And, and yeah, he was that, yes. <laughs> now, to be fair, he illustrated a lot. He did a lot of really good book covers too, a bunch of Paul Anderson stuff and some C.J. Yeah. Sherry novels and all that. So, Melanie yeah. Foster. Well, to be yeah. completely fair to everybody, Lord of the Rings is a rip off of the sh of the Hobbit. So, let's it just is. be honest. <laughs> you know what? What? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, like the funny thing is, this whole episode came because I was looking at some old star logs I found in the garage, and there was this giant article on Urshak. 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 Which is and a totally I'm like, this is different. Fascinating. Story. And then I'm thinking, I, this is so interesting. I knew nothing about this. Obviously, I'd read it 40 years ago, but I hadn't, right. I hadn't remember, thought about it since. And, and I'm like, oh my God, well, Charles is a fan of the show. I, we should have him on to talk about his dad and his uncle because that would be so interesting. And we, we can hear the story. And then, of course, it ended up being far more interesting than I even anticipated. So I'm I'm really, really glad to hear. We didn't even get to talk about James Bond. God. No, <laughs> oh we my didn't. Goodness. We didn't. But, you, you know, your, 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 your dad should have done the posters for some of those movies. Although yeah. Robert McGinnis, I, I got to say, he did a pretty freaking swell job. <laughs> He, my but yeah, dad, we didn't get to talk about Bond. That'll be my for our dad next podcast. Did get to, my dad did end up sitting in on a recording session with John Barry. 
Oh, in, how cool is that? In, that's in, really cool. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Do you remember what what film? I don't. Um, it, it, but it was. Um, this would have been in the eighties. So um, I don't know. Was it a Bond uh, movie or was it one of his other? No, films? it was not. It was it not was a Bond out of movie. Africa. Yeah, it was probably that. Or <laughs> yeah, right. Somewhere Dances in with time. Wolves. Dances Dances with the walls, walls, right? right. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. matter. They all sound like Moonraker, right? After a certain point, he just kept this <laughs> Moonraker over and over. They wrong. all sound like Moonraker. <laughs> don't they? Oh, man. <laughs> I, I go to the mattresses for John Barry, but, you know, I have friends who are big film music uh, fans as well. And oh, I just love like, it. It all sounds, it's like, we talk about James Horner sounding the same, but Barry yeah. all sounds the same. But I love John Barry. And, like, Body Heat is, you know, that's yeah. Uh, yeah. one of my, the great scores of all time. Right. I mean, oh, you know, even, the, and his schlock is great. Like, um, Stella Star, you know. Yeah, um, I was about to say, yeah, exactly. Or or The Black Hole, right? Oh, like The Black Hole is a great uh -huh. score. It is. Yeah. It's All great. 12 minutes of it. Well, we'll have to save the black hole for another time. Yeah, please. But, uh, but this was so great having you on. The, I'm so glad you did this. This was so much fun. Oh, I had and, a wonderful time. Thank you so much, yeah. everybody. Oh no, it's 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 our pleasure, and uh, we'll have to have you back because you're 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 an interesting cat. Anytime. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Charles. Thank <laughs> bye you, bye. Charles. Wow, that was that was great. I, I we had to send him down to engineering, but uh, I heard Beverly's putting on a play. Um, what? What? I have no idea what you're talking <laughs> I, about. I, I I don't know. I'm just, I'm trying to go with the whole completely De different enterprise, thing. man. Oh, it's I an see. entirely new enterprise. You don't know it at twelfth as well as we do because clearly you're confused. <laughs> I thought that was so much fun, and uh, he's uh, he's a hoot, as we say. Yeah, um, yeah. I could listen to him all day. I mean. It's just that this episode would have gone as long as a uh, countdown on uh, Inglorious Trexpers. I'm Plus glad we have to could... record more episodes today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I was able to fill in a couple of the blanks between uh, their Star Wars poster and Tom Jung's, because that's a story that was that, that is shrouded in uh, in antiquity and mystery. Oh, um, that was great, Darren. Because uh, just uh, as uh, as a piece of luck, I got to work with Tom Jung on a movie. And uh, he was just doing illustration work. And uh, I said, you're not the same Tom Jung who did the Star Wars poster. He said, yeah, yeah, I am. And mm. uh, I just, I glommed onto him for uh, at least uh, a couple months because uh, he was a really sweet guy. And again, an artist that was, uh, you know, often uh, taken advantage of. But uh, the, the funny thing is that because of his uh, protecting that artwork, uh, he he didn't get to have his stuff on everything in, under the sun, so yeah. it's a very it's a very strange world out there for the artists. Well, and that's what I love about our podcast. It's not just a bunch of a fans jawing about things we like. You know, the fact that we've worked in this business for so long gives us, you know, I think a really interesting perspective when we're talking to these people. And I found that story about Tom Jung fascinating. It's all because you've worked in the business low these many years and had, you know, these interesting insights and uh, lucky to have connected to so many of the people that influenced me over the years. And yeah. like all of us. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, I got to tell you, it means so much to me and I'll, I'll have to share this with Rob uh, that uh, Tim Hildebrandt was such a big fan oh, of free so enterprise. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So awesome. I mean, that's, that's really, that's really special, you know, because it's like the people that we idolize growing up to then have them because that's what free enterprise is about. It's about, you know, our love of Shatner, yeah. but you know, it's about our love of genre. And then to have somebody who's like this genre legend, like Tim Hildebrand be a fan of what we created. Yeah. That's it's, it's really, cool. it's really special. It's, it's special. So, um, anyway, well, this was great. And, uh, it's always fun, uh, stopping down on deck 78, uh, to explore some Trek adjacent subjects. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, we'll be back. Uh, if you want to continue uh, to enjoy uh, Deck 78, you can subscribe at trekstrusplus.com. And we are attempting to um, make sure that our international listeners will be able to have access to that real soon. So check that out. Um, hopefully, by the time you listen to this, we'll have resolved the issues uh, with it just being domestic only. Um, because you're missing out on some great shows if uh, you're not... Uh, um, and uh, if you're a fan of the podcast, please listen to Glorious Trexperts every Thursday. 430 Movie drops Fridays and Trexperts Briefing Room on Tuesdays. So that's a full week of uh, of the Trexperts podcast 
network with uh, Deck 78 coming in uh, on a hopefully re regular basis on Wednesdays when it when we drop new episodes. So uh, a lot to follow. And of course, you can uh, meet us in Richmond, Virginia. Most at, of us. Uh, at Most least of 66 us. percent of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, uh, they, they, they'll be there at the um, the Richmond uh, Convention, um, GalaxyCon.com for more details. And uh, we'll be doing a couple of panels and uh, it should be a lot of fun for most of us. Some of us. <laughs> well, 66% of us will be 66% sober. It'll be great. Well, there you go. But uh, I will be there and uh, wishing you well. And if you want to actually start a conversation, <laughs> probably tell me you like free enterprise because maybe I will talk to you then. Otherwise, I'll just give you a dainty wave and sign a poster and send you on your merry way. Um, okay. And if you're lucky, brief eye contact. Brief eye contact. But we're not promising them. anything. A little flick of the gaze. <laughs> don't you look at me. <laughs> don't, no. don't look at me. Let's not go all Frank Booth on this. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm a misanthrope, but I'm not a, a complete asshole. Um, <laughs> yes, anyway, well, of course. thank you for joining us here on behalf of uh, Darren Docterman, um, Ashley Edward Miller. And uh, a big shout out and thanks to Mark Rivera and Peter Holmstrom for everything they do for the podcast. Uh, but until next time, fire the rockets. <laughs> <laughs>